Hi, and welcome to another episode of Butt Plugin with QDOT. This episode is going to be the first in a new series I'm calling QDOT Speaks, where I take an old presentation I did and act like it's new, so I have some cheap content to upload to my channel. Now, in this episode, we're going to be looking at a presentation I did in 2007 at the first Ars Electronica conference held in San Francisco at the kink.com porn palace, which is where kink was before they bought the San Francisco armory. Now, this talk was done on October 6th, 2007, and this was the inaugural year of Ars Electronica, which was a sex and technology conference held by the Austrian art group Monochrome. It was held annually for about eight years and involved talks and performances and art installations all about sex and technology. I was involved in it for a few years, and later episodes of this series will feature more talks from me from later years of this conference. Now, this talk that I'm giving in this video happened about two to three years after I really started working in sex tech. It's basically an overview of what I've learned so far, as well as a few of the DIY projects I did in that time. It's still fairly early in my career on this. I was really pretty tech focused there and kind of forgot that there was this whole people and sex thing going on too. But it's still a pretty good overview of sex and technology and a lot of it's still valid today. And there's even ideas in there that ended up influencing my later career. Uh, for instance, there's going to be, at the end of the talk, a reference to obfuscated macros, which was really sort of the first idea that the current butt plug uh, project that I'm working on at buttplug.io came from. So anyways, uh, this talk is an hour long, so I'm probably not going to have any content after it, so I'll go ahead and get all of this out of the way. Uh, if you like this content, please smack that like and subscribe button. And if you'd like to continue seeing it and help me out by making it so I can buy more sex toys, please donate to my Patreon at patreon.com slash qdot. And also visit my websites at metafetish.com and buttplug.io. So with that intro out of the way, here's another hour of me rambling. What's there? Man. Oh, yes. This is the presentation of the future right here. Um, yeah, because now, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, oh, my God, it actually worked that time. Okay, I'm not going to rely on that. But <laughs> so, anyways, hi, uh, my name is Kyle Mishulis, and my talk is... Um, Getting the message across. I, I swear to God, I wrote these slides and I know it's on them. Um, hardware and software interfaces for sexual interactions. So, uh, first off, a little bit about me. I run all of this right here. Uh, first off, I run Slashdom.org, which is a site about open source sex toy building. So, if you've ever wanted to figure out exactly how your vibrator works, how your teledildonics toy works, whatever else, and then go and build it for like one tenth of the price, I help you out with that. And then there's opendildonics.org, which is a wiki where if you come up with something new and cool, you can add to it. And uh, mmorgy.com, which is about sex and massively multiplayer online games like Second Life, World of Warcraft, so on and so forth. It's happening there and it's happening hard. Um, <laughs> Uh, and then I'm also on the leadership council of the International Game Developer Association's Sex and Games Special Interest Group. We sort of help the game industry figure out how not to have another hot coffee incident, which was the Grand Theft Auto thing that like went to Congress and all. And also, how to portray sex in a way that's not like BMX Triple X, which was basically a biking game with a bunch of boobs, or Dead or Alive Volleyball, which was a volleyball game with a bunch of boobs. Um, <laughs> So, uh, I, I fulfill many roles and titles in my life, but probably my favorite one is Teledildontics in Teledildontics Engineer. So, say it with me now. Teledildontics. Yes, it will become your favorite word ever. I know so many people are like, oh yeah, word of the fucking year right there. <laughs> so, uh, Teledildontics is the term for remote controlled sex toys. So, over the internet or Bluetooth, whatever else, if someone else has that control in their hand, you can call it teledildonics, they've started calling it cyberdildonics and blue dildonics, but it just kind of has that sort of old school feel to it. So uh, my talk today um, goes over this theory, that 
by researching interfaces used for sex on computers, we can learn things about ourselves. I'm going to prove that somehow. Uh, <laughs> Uh, here's an overview of my talk. Uh, first off, I, this is going in sort of a uh, protocol stack because I'm a fucking engineer. So the, um, we will start with the psychological layer, and then move to the physical layer, the interaction layer, the future of the interaction layer with all of its flying cars, and uh, finally, oh shit, well that was it. Um, so, uh, and if you have any questions at all, during this presentation, please realize I am an engineer and I expect all of you to know this too, just intrinsically, and I figure that everyone will get it, but if you don't, raise your, feel free to raise your hand during the presentation and go, Kyle, what the fuck did you just say? So, with that, we begin with the psychological layer, or, God, I fucking hate all of you. So, as an engineer, I expect to have sort of a spec when I design things. And here's the spec I expect to have when I'm building something about sex. So you have signal A and slot B. And you expect signal A to connect to slot B. And after that connection, you expect slot B to process for a standard amount of time, after which it spawns a child process. <laughs> then signal A and slot B take their uh, mutual resources and uh, devote them to that child process until some time at which they are garbage collected uh, by the operating deity, and the cycle begins anew. So, it's easy. I mean, it's a really nice implementation. You put two things together, and another one comes out, so on and so forth, until the end of time. What's the problem with that? Fusers. <laughs> Whenever you ship a piece of software or a piece of hardware to people, you're like, you could use it for this. It, it's awesome for that. It's fucking perfect for that. Oh no, oh no, 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 no. They're going to find other uses for it. Users do not realize that perfection is to be looked at, not touched, just looked at. <laughs> and so you come up with diagrams that say, okay, here is signal A and slot B. <laughs> but oh no, some people want to connect signal A to signal A. Some people want to connect all sorts of signals and slots together at the same time. Some people decide to find a new slot to connect it to. Or some people want to turn their slots into signals, or put, find new signals to put in the slots, or present their slots and signals in a new way, and it just goes on and on, and you never know what people are going to fucking come up with. <laughs> And that makes life hell as me. How the fuck am I supposed to accommodate? But then you realize, people put so much of their time into this, so much of their lives into this, that it's really, it becomes the new creative outlet. Think about how many millennia that we've gone through where we've heard stories of the jilted lover or whatever else, things that have come out due to sex. Not just the reproduction, but the fact that for us it is a social means. That you can't really not, like, just try to, okay, have an orgasm, and you're done. No, you actually need to think about how can we make this creative, how can we harness people's genetic drive to reproduce in order to make really awesome shit. And therefore, we enter the physical layer, or what the fuck are you doing to yourself? Um, so this is a, this uh, portion will be a overview of what hardware is out there right now. And this is just the mechanical means of the hardware. So first off, we have the shaky. Um, this is vibrators. You know them, you love them, they're vibrators. There's not a whole lot to say about them. Um, I mean, they come in every shape and size. They're in rabbits, they're in sticks, apparently. Uh, they come in industrial forms, too, according to Google. Um, and here's also a wonderful image of um, how to relieve hysteria, which we talked about a couple of talks ago. So, and then you get the thrusty twirly machine. So, first off, our, our sponsors, Kink.com, fucking machines. They are, they are experts in this. And here's uh, another toy uh, put out by a guy named Alan Stein called the Thrill Hammer. Basically, it's like this really big-ass 
HR Geiger gynecological chair um, with a bunch of webcams around it and a modified Sibian because really that thing needed to be souped up. Um, and you can actually, get, and you can control it through the net, so, and it's really fun because I have one at the Museum of Sex in New York, and he handed over the controls to me once when they were having a party there. So I was like sitting at home waiting for people to walk up, and they turned the thing up to 11. And like, I think people thought, thought it was going to attack them. And then they have the realization that someone sits on that and puts that thing in there. And they just get this great look in their eyes. It's wonderful. So, and finally down here, this never unfortunately made it to market because I think it's one of the most wonderful toys ever to come out of humanity. This is a tongue with stirrups. Yes, it was going to be put out by a company called Utapex, which unfortunately went under. So obviously getting a, uh, taking a little bit from Cronenberg there uh, and making the perfect coffee table piece out of it, it was going to be a teledildonic tongue that would sort of twirl and poke. <laughs> I feel like I just killed someone's really perverted puppy pieces. <laughs> and then we have electrostimulation, which um, a lot of people are kind of scared of because you're shocking yourself in the nuts. Um, and there's every right to be uh, scared of it. I actually have a homemade one here that's built out of a fart machine, if anyone would, like, if anyone would like to see that later. Um, so electrostimulation, what that does is you put patches in interesting places that do not cross your heart, so, but usually you try to stay below the waist, and they will stimulate the nerves between them. You're basically, your body creates the circuit that the power goes through, which can be really, really fun due to the fact that the nerves are also what cause your muscle stimulation. So you can actually have toys that make you fuck yourself. Yeah, yay for technology. <laughs> um, this, uh, what I'm showing up here actually is considered to be the Rolls Royce of the Electro-STEM world, the ET-312B. It slices, it dices, it makes julienne fries, and it fucks you in the ass. Um, and this is, a, and here's what it looks like to try and put together programs for it, so you only need like a bachelor's degree. Um, and then finally, these are electrodes for it, uh, unipolar electrodes, so you would put like one of these in a hole somewhere down there. And um, you could put like a pad or a ring or something somewhere else, and wherever those two things were, there would be a circuit. So, um, and then finally we hit the comboe, which is an amalgamation of whatever, uh, of those last three, basically. Uh, so up here we have the um, to a Toys in Motion Priceless, which is, uh, has a flashlight in it that rotates and goes back and forth and runs off a handheld screwdriver. So yeah, that's actually what that little black tube is up there. Um, and down here we have the Zhizhou, which I will show more of later, but it does all sorts of cool shit. I'll show you. Uh, just trust me. J-E-J-O-U-E. Um, uh, -E -E. Yes. So now we hit the interface layer, or getting jiggly with it. I'm sorry. Um, so this is about uh, all of the interfaces that you use to control the physical layers of these toys. So now, I, and the thing is you figure, well, isn't there more in the physical layers? Not really right now, no. It's really, really cheap to produce vibration. It's fairly cheap to produce elect electrostim, except for the fact that, once again, you are shocking people, so the insurance on that is kind of high. And, um, the thrusting toys, on the other hand, very expensive, unless you know where to salvage your parts and stuff. The um, thrusting machines they sell at Mr. S actually uses a 1 uh, 1 8 horsepower, 173 RPM motor to do with linear actuation for the thrusting. Uh, it sells for $1,200 in parts. It's 700 bucks, just at cost. So. That's really why there's not a lot going on there in terms of, and that's why you see so much vibration, is because we can buy a vibrating motor from China for like cents, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them, and then resell them because they're used for sex for $50, $60. So why innovate? Um, and luckily we have some people here in the audience though that are innovating, and I can't wait to talk about their stuff once it's done.
So anyways, uh, the part that I work on more, because I suck at the mechanical stuff, I'm all electrical and programming, uh, is the interface layer. So how do we make the thrusty thrusty, or the vibratey vibratey, or whatever else? Um, and first off, one of the really popular layers is audio. Uh, so what will be happening with these toys, we have the iBuzz, the Oh My Bod, the audio, which unfortunately no longer exists. Um, so poor... Uh, well, I don't know what the sexy drink to pour out is on the curb for a dead sex toy. But, um, and then the um, talk to me, which is not actually out yet, it is the future. So the idea behind these toys is like, say you're listening to some techno and you get like some <laughs> going on. Um, then these toys have a filter in them to know what is. And they will translate that into motor speed. So your turns into except it's the motor. Uh, and it, it provides sort of a synesthetic experience because you can be fucked by your music, which is kind of cool, I mean, if you listen to techno, because they don't really react well to rock and stuff quite yet. So these top two, well, these three toys all, um, all work on low-pass filters, so you get like maybe 200 hertz, which is the um, The new, This one actually has two, yes, count them, two sensors in it. This will be the bass. This will be treble. So you will actually get different feelings depending on what the uh, what the music is doing, and it's wireless. Hopefully, it'll be out sometime in the next few months. So that's the idea behind audio toys. And then there's people that take audio toys a step farther. Uh, this is the talking head vibrator. Not only does it vibrate to the music going on, it has an MP3 player in it. <laughs> this is the controller. These are the speakers. And so, while it's down there, you can be, like, rocking out. Um, and the even better part is, and Steve Johansson called this the top toy of 2006. And I say this to preface what I'm going to play for you next, which is the fact that they send out audio files. You can pay for audio files to go on this thing. Quisiera besarte, toparte, acariciarte. Quisiera hacerte a, el amor como a ti más Juan, te gusta. The Latin lover. Sí, eso así a mí. Okay, yeah, yeah. Sí. Oh, lo haces muy bien. Qué rico, honey. I love you, honey. Es muy buena para esto. Sí. This goes on for another four minutes. I've really tempted to make you sit through it. But... No, 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 no. I got this off the website for free. But this is not the only yeah, it is the C3. So, so yeah, at least they <laughs> Oh, God. So, and the thing is, Juan is not the only one. Oh, no. Oh, no. Hey, Johannes. You want to translate again? Schenke deine strammen, sportlichen Beine, diese wunderschönen Schenkel. Ja, ich küsse deine Schenkel. So yes, for everyone on the webcast and in the recording, that was your beautiful thighs, I kiss your thighs. <laughs>
wrong mountain, no, mountain the mountain man. Right? <laughs> <laughs> because Bernic means mountain, but Bernic, I don't know, it's a city in Norway. I, I, I think we have thought more than enough about this subject. <laughs> so next up is remote interfaces. This is Teledolonix. Um, so you are on one side with your vibrator hooked into your computer, and someone else is on the other side with a piece of control software that they have either a slider bar, um, which basically, I mean, it looks like any other Windows interface. You just sit there with your mouse and you go faster, slower, faster, slower, faster, 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 faster. Have you ever tried to fuck someone with a mouse before? <laughs> it's really hard. And it makes your hand cramp. It's like the worst hand job ever. <laughs> Um, and actually, we were playing around uh, with interfaces for this and found, however, that tablets, like tablets that you draw on and stuff, make amazing interfaces for it. You can get nice, smooth lines and smooth transitions with it. So, yeah, it's a little piece of uh, uh, human computer interface stuff that you can go publish on now. Uh, um, so, of course, yeah, so all they're doing is mimicking just what comes with Windows because it's nice and easy. And then there's this. Uh, these are the interfaces that are being sold right now for the Simulate, which is probably the most popular toy out there at the moment. That up there is a Simulate, the spaceship, because goddammit, spaceships are sexy, especially when they have a penis as the throttle. <laughs> and so, yeah, these are all settings changes right here that will um, change the speed or the rotation or whatever else. This was Utapex's, the people that were making the tongue that unfortunately went under. Um, this was Utapex's interface, which they fucking ripped off of Simulate. God damn it, that spaceship's a good idea. Why didn't we do that first? Oh wait, we still can. Now there are two sexy spaceships in the world. And you actually view the webcam through the picture, through the picture windows on the spaceship. So you are, I guess it's like some sort of like nanotech thing or something like that. Um, and this also shows a fun thing uh, that Utopex was also going to sell, which was an online spanker, which was basically a bat hooked up to like a traffic cone. Uh, and really, again, while I'm on the, on the subject of fun stuff from Utopex we never did see, they did have a um, bukake toy. It was basically an internet controlled uh, super Soaker. <laughs> and they sold flavor packs. <laughs> yes, Bavarian cream came with it, though. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they definitely had some inventiveness for not actually getting anything done, which is kind of sad, because really, I mean, you talk about a party, it's not a party until you have a bukkake machine going on. <laughs> uh, so next up is actually the Zhuzhou, and... Um, Here's what the Zhuzhou looks like in action. I ripped this straight out of their software, which is why it's a tiny little uh, screen. But So the Zhuzhou looks kind of like your iPod, except it's bent because you have pelvic muscles, and it's for females. Um, so it has a spinning disc that vibrates, rotates, and moves up and down. You have three different um, movements for it. And the cool thing about it is the programming interface is all yours. This is an interface called Pleasureware, built by Soda, the same people that did the Soda Walker uh, Flash back in like late 90s, early 2000s, that you could actually like just draw some vert vertices on the screen and put some lines in between, and all of a sudden it was a walking being. So they have basically created a sex sequencer. Uh, what you do is you move these little colored blocks up into this time, uh, time sequenced line, and then you hit play, and I'll just go back, and what the blocks define are how fast, whether this is moving up and down, or vibrating, or rotating, and then you can set other parameters on top of that that will allow you to say how fast it should go, how slow it should go, how long that certain block should last. And then the really cool part, too, is they have built in a buddy list. <laughs> uh, so that you can share your grooves, as they are called, with other people. And you can also have like favorite groove manufacturers and stuff, and you don't pay for it. It's all free, all traded over their own internal secure P2P network. So they pretty much got it all right the first time, except for the fact that it's $400 and on it for women. 
But, you know, I mean, I have to take the good where I can find it in this stuff, because otherwise... <laughs> um, so, then, then there's synchronization interfaces. I actually have one of them here. Unfortunately, I don't have a Windows machine to run it on. Um, what you thought was just an innocuous silver bowling pin. <laughs> okay, they don't have enough hands. Um, happens. Kind of yeah. uh, no, I, I think I got it. I think I got it. I, I don't let anyone touch my bowling pin vagina. <laughs> 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 so, obviously, the surprise is out now. It's a bowling pin vagina. I know everyone has one of these these days. <laughs> this is the segment virtual hole. It has seven motors in it, two down each side and one in the top. Each of them are individually controllable through USB if you'd like to see a demo of it later. Um, I have software to do it because I'm trying to turn it into a musical instrument. Um, <laughs> I mean, come on, who does not want to crank out Freebird on one of these motherfuckers? <laughs> um, anyways, what it was originally made to do, though, is synchronize with movies. So, say you are watching a porno, and like there's a blowjob happening, so you've got like this motion going on, giggity giggity, and um, uh, so what you can do is in their software put a dot on the video that's on like the forehead or something, and that will do um, motion tracking back and forth, which will then map to this. So it will actually start going, the vibrations will start going back and forth with the movie. Yeah. Um, this has actually been around for a while. There's, a toy, there's another toy called the Virtual Sex Machine, which um, hasn't gotten the best reviews because it's basically a penis pump that works with movies. Um, and it also does the same thing, where if something's moving back and forth, it moves back and forth with it. Um, the problem with synchronization interfaces is, um, I, I mean, I'm sure everyone in the audience has some experience with human orifices, as it were. <laughs> and you can probably f feel this and realize it's not really like a vagina. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's an approximation. It, it is in the realm of vaginaism at some point. Um, but really, it doesn't map to actually having sex. So what you're feeling is vibration when you expect to feel like slighty, thrusty, and it just doesn't really map out in your brain quite right. So really, once the new shiny has worn off something like that, people are like, oh my god, I can synchronize with movies. And you realize, well, I can synchronize with movies, but it kind of sucks. <laughs> um, but they make awesome musical instruments. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then uh, something I've worked pretty heavily in is video games. Um, the idea of synchronizing, um, or not really synchronizing, but just using video games as a sexual environment. I call this the recontextualization of force feedback. Because force feedback right now in modern video game systems is your controller shakes. Something big moves, the controller shakes. Something scary happens, the controller shakes. Your score goes up, the controller shakes, whatever. Your controller fucking shakes. <laughs> I mean, and it's a way to get your attention, but it's not really a way to relay context out of the game. However, if you turn it into a contextual piece of hardware, if you hook a video game up to a controller that happens to say be hooked to a vibrator that's a sex toy, then you come from a talk four hours ago where someone mentioned Crash becoming a possibility to Crash being a reality. I created something called the Sex Box, which is that up there. Uh, it was a sex toy that hooked up to an Xbox controller. So I just took out the vibration motors and that and hooked it to a dildo, basically. That makes any single video game environment a sexual environment. And you're probably going, well, why the fuck do you want to do that? Well, video games are sort of the realization of our imagination as close as we can possibly get it with today's current technology. So there's, and there's lists of video games everywhere, people that have certain specific fetishes that find them in video games, and they really, really like that video game after that. Um, well, a common example I usually use is, there's a site called vorophile.com, which is for the fetish of vor. The uh, fetish of being eaten, eating something, or watching something being eaten, usually whole. Um, and it's not the same as cannibalism, I know what you're thinking, but no, there's actually a difference because because <laughs> I'll, let, I'll, I'll let your imagination try to sort it out, sort out what it is. 
Um, but they actually have a list of every single video game from the Atari 2600 on, uh, where you can see something being eaten, be, have your character be eaten, or have your character eat something. It's exhaustive. It's amazing. It's a fucking encyclopedia of board video games. So people really follow video games to try and enact what's going on in their imagination. And if you contextualize their feedback with something that's already going on in that video game, then you've just created a sexual environment for them. And I use the um, example of J.G. Ballard's Crash here, which is a, basically a novel about people who get off on car crashes, and it was actually used as a social analogy, but I'm not a literature person, so I took it literally. Uh, um, and I, so I hooked up the Xbox controller to a game called Burnout, which is a racing game that actually has a mode specifically where you crash your car as hard as fucking possible. And it really makes the vibrator go. So, there is the reality of Crash right there. Um, and then there is Res, which was the accidental but not so much sexual video game. Um, and usually I have to try and explain what it's like, but I finally got a movie. So... Yeah, the fucking disco ball. <laughs> We're here today to talk about Res for the PlayStation 2. This is a pretty unique game in that it's the first Sega published title for the Sony PlayStation 2. This game comes to you by United Game Artists, or also known as the same team that brought you Space Channel 5 for the Dreamcast. Now, it's a pretty interesting game in that it's kind of a shooter, but in another sense, it's almost like an interactive music game. So it's easy to dismiss the game as a shooter, but it's, it's a lot deeper than that. Now, Res plays pretty simply. It's, it's very similar to kind of old school shooter games, similar to space. Okay, that guy's really boring. Um, what it is, is you're like this wireframe guy, and you're flying through this wireframe world, and there's some techno, and then you just shoot at some, you, you like shoot at some shit, and then there's like music, and the music goes along with the shit you're shooting, and it's like, wow, it's fucking awesome. Why don't they let me review games? <laughs> so anyways, uh, for Res in Japan, uh, I'm not sure how many of you know, but your PlayStation 2 actually has two USB ports on it. And they released the Res Trans Vibrator, which is this right here. It was made to go in your shirt pocket. <laughs> and it basically went along with the beats in the game because the game was made to be a synesthetic experience, much like the audio vibes that I talked about earlier. So they wanted you to get the visual and the audio and the haptic all at once to really meld the game into a full experience. Of course, that got used for the picture I'm standing in front of right now, which is um, Jane from Game Girl Advance in 2003 went, Hey, I've got a vibrator that works with a video game. I should use it as a vibrator. And basically, the video game fandom collapsed in on itself. <laughs> They're like, oh my god, sex with a video game, and then their heads exploded. <laughs> and that really was the first movement toward sex hardware in mainstream video games. And the creator of Res has actually come out and said that the trans vibrator was not made in any way for sex. It really seriously was um, meant to go in your shirt pocket. <laughs> Um, and now there's actually been an open source version of it, which I have up here. This is called the Drum and Trance Vibe, uh, that you can buy off the internet for $30, I believe, because this is impossible to find now. It's like 60 bucks from China. But the hardware has been reverse engineered, and you can now just go on the internet and buy it through PayPal or whatever else. So, um, and since it is a game hardware peripheral, you can buy it through PayPal. It's not adult. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> So next up, and, and then there's just the silly shit that I've done. <laughs> um, because I mean, really, when you have as many vibrators as I do, and you have the technical knowledge that I do, you get bored. <laughs> um, so there, okay, that was just me duct taping a dildo to a computer. It was just funny. Um, <laughs> Um, and then there is, this is the exercise bike controlled vibrator that I built. So the faster you went, 
the faster the vibrator would go. And it would actually also do patterns and things like that. And if you slowed down, it would start making the patterns more random or just stop doing anything or whatever else. So the more you wanted to get off, the faster you had to bite. Talk about burning calories in two ways. Um, <laughs> And uh, this up here was actually not something I built. Um, it was like, I just love the random shit that I get sent now. This was the Wii Brader. It used a, a Wiimote and the Trans Vibrator. So the, and the fact that the Wiimote works in three space, so I can move it wherever I want. Um, the, so you can now do gestural mapping to vibration speeds. So if you were to say, enact some sort of gesture on the Wiimote, it would actually make the vibrator go. Um, and this last one down here, I've got another slide on now. So why are interfaces important? Why have I been standing up here throwing all of this stuff at you? It's not just the, the future of sex toys and everything else. Why is this stuff important to research and spend my free time on? So first off, look at what people will do to have sex, period. Every single one of these images is off the same website, homemade-sex-toys.com. They're kind of like the mildly retarded little brother of Slashdong, even though they've been <laughs> around way longer than I have, they're way more prolific. They don't really like solder stuff, they put dildos on lightsabers, <laughs> and then they put condoms on joysticks. And and their, their front page is uh, how to have sex with a watermelon. I mean, so really, people will do a lot just to be able to stick something in them or stick it in something. And now, look at what people will do with technology to have sex. And not just me, not just my silly ass projects. First off, DIY Electrostim. Electrostim has the biggest DIY community outside of maybe dolls that I've seen. People are so fucking far ahead of everything else that's coming out commercially right now because they've been developing it for years and they've burned their nuts off trying to do it. <laughs> um, so, the, um, yeah, what I'm showing here actually, this is a diagram of a stereo stimmer, which is a really fucking bad idea because it's not actually isolated from mains voltage, so you really could kill yourself with it. Do not build stereo stimmers, people. Um, and yeah, this is a ten. This is a diagram for a tens unit. And the funny thing is, the, the links these people will go to to build electrodes for themselves. So electrodes are what like what you stick in somewhere or put on somewhere that actually transfers the electricity to your skin and through your body. So lots of kitchen implements used actually. Um, I picked these pictures up off of some um, forums on building your own electrodes. So this person was talking about using a juicer to build an electrode. And these, uh, this guy soldered together some copper tubing and used a melon baller uh, to make an electrode with a cop cap on it. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's risky shit. You better like, have a decent idea of what's going on, with, or well, you should have a decent idea of what's, uh, what's going on in physiology and electricity. Most of these people don't. They have no clue. It's just like, I made something metal and it shocked me and it felt good. I'm going to do it again. <laughs> um, and there are, there, are, there are people out there looking, for the, uh, looking out for those people in the forums going, no, you shouldn't do that. But even so, who listens to the internet? Uh, and like I said, they really do. Like, I, I didn't... It's a dick in a box! How could I not put it in my presentation? So this is actually what we call a bipolar trode. So it has um, whatever is connected to it. It has is uh, flowing the current. So the idea here is they they went and got like a little drawer from Home Depot, and then there's a metal bar down here and a metal bar up here going into the urethra. So it's sort of so they're sort of being sounded. But the fact is, you can connect like ground to this and power to this, and your penis is now in that circuit. So that is what DIY electrostim looks like. Um, and then there's DIY solo BDSM software. Uh, this is a program called Cyber Mistress, and if any of you out there are in like Web 2.0 shit, which we're in the Bay Area, so everyone, uh, uh, you can easily rebuild one of these and charge a shitload for it. <laughs> uh, all this does is you bring up a program that has, it, it's like a really, really stupid expert system. 
um, that will ask you questions. It's like, okay, what did you do today? And then you say, I did this, this, and this, and it goes through and figures out, okay, was that what I told you to do or whatever? And you give it a list of your clothing, a list of the toys that you have, and it basically acts like a live-in dom or uh, master for you. So I like this was my test run of the program actually, and um, yeah, I so I wrote my uh, my daily report, which was a combination of what I did that day and Laura Mipsum. Uh, and then I asked, well, what should I do? And I chose like, uh, there's like 10 levels, so I was like, level six, which apparently is drink a coffee with a layer of cum and a biscuit covered in cum. <laughs> Breakfast of champions. <laughs> Uh, it usually has to do with soiling yourself in public somehow. The thing is, this has, a, this has a full scripting system behind it, so you can write your own levels too. People trade out levels. People trade out the pictures that go here and sound files. Um, I've actually written some device control for this uh, for this sort of things. So people like wanted their vibrator to go or something like that while they were talking to their piece of software that dominates them. <laughs> and, <laughs> oh snap. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so yeah, and there's actually like six or seven of these programs out there that are pretty much homebrew. That I haven't seen a professional one yet, but there's also like programs that will lock down pictures and stuff so you can only look at your porn at certain times. And this is not so like your significant others won't look at your porn. No, it encrypts it so you don't know what it is. So, um, and then there's virtual worlds. Boy, don't we love virtual worlds these days. Um, I actually created the first sex toy interface for the Second Life virtual world, so that you can do anything, be anything, and vibrate to doing and or being anything. Um, and the thing is though, so yeah, Second Life gets a ton of press right now due to the fact that, yeah, there's, there's sex in it, just a little bit. Um, <laughs> um, but the fact is, it's been going on, there's been stuff going on in virtual worlds for decades. What I'm showing back here actually is a listing of what's known as WICs. So, um, I can't, w -I, there used to be a utility called WI, which was like what information or what interests or something like that. That basically, what is? What is? Oh, okay. Um, so, you would uh, use that to see what other people around, uh, around you were interested in. And so in text worlds, you could use Wix to uh, see what everyone in the same room you were in was into. And I mean, gigantic lists of, um, uh, of fetishes. It was basically the virtual hanky code. So, and the thing is, they were still doing this back in like 93 and stuff though. And now today we're like, well, we have eHarmony with 40 different levels of matching. It's like, no, all you need is that. <laughs> So, yeah, in virtual worlds, it's huge. That's another talk. So, <laughs> so, really what we get down to is that computers require resources but do not specifically reproduce. However, we do specifically reproduce. By mapping the organic idea... Okay, I'm just going to read off my fucking slides. <laughs> By mapping the organic idea of methods of reproduction into a space that does not require it, organic, possibly human interfaces emerge. <laughs> um, um, so the idea is, I mean, okay, yeah, computers require resources. I mean, they require, like, we breathe, they take electricity. We pass on knowledge, they copy data. But computers don't really need to reproduce, and when they do, it usually becomes the thing of sci-fi catastrophe. We've all heard of Grey Goo, the nanomachine that learns to build itself and then takes over the world, and we're all fucked. That's the only thing you hear about in terms of computerized reproduction at the moment, really. Um, so, really, if we try to map our need for reproduction onto that, what we are doing, well, to learn how to make a computer more human, we have to fuck them. Thank you, <laughs> Stefan. <laughs> I had never heard it, I, I, I'd been putting it in like all sorts of academic terms and I was talking to Stefan last week, and he's like, well, it's just that. I'm like, well, goddamn, so it is. <laughs> and so really, yeah, the idea is that if we try and figure out what what, what we do to have sex, either with the computer or with someone else through the computer or whatever else, 
Think about it, if you have an interface that you are comfortable enough with to have an, inter an interactive, intimate experience, yet you're still scared to try and install your printer, <laughs> maybe we should be making the printer drivers look more like that other software. I mean, it's sort of Occam's razor there, but still, it's an interesting thing to look at. So, I'll give you a couple of ideas of um, interaction uh, projects that I've done so far. The first off was uh, Twitter Dildonics. This was a stupid boy, I wonder if I can get myself some attention project that went way, way overboard at South by Southwest this year. Um, Twitter, uh, for those of you that are not familiar, is a microblogging utility. So you can blog 140 characters or less that are made to be relayed to SMS or some other nice mobile system. What I did was um, made a yeah, fucking word. Uh, I made a Python script that took the trans vibrator and took the values of the characters from uh, a Twitter message. Like the way that we usually transmit English characters is a value, a numeric value between zero and two fifty five. Um, and it's like A through Z are like 37 through whatever, and so yeah, there's capital letters, then small letters, then numbers. Um, so the funny thing was, we got all sorts of emergent properties out of this. What would happen, it would vibrate for one second per character, and take the value of that character to set the vibration speed, zero being the lowest, 255 being the highest. So first off, we got the recontextualization of posts, which was the fact that you were sitting there with a vibrator going to someone talking about having just made tuna helper. Or, yeah, it just the, mon the mundanities of life that people felt the need to post to a public forum they had no control over and they had no idea where the information was going, suddenly became sex to someone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, tuna helper was a lot hot. No, no, it wasn't. <laughs> and we also had an emergent language fetish. This was complete, since I was doing this on Mac, everything was coming through as Unicode, so we could get like Chinese and Cyrillic and everything else. Um, and so that maps way, way farther out than anything that, Engl any of the values that English were going to be. So anytime we got a Russian post, or a Chinese post, or a Japanese post, the thing went fucking insane. It was just like buzzing like fucking crazy, because it was getting such a high value that we hadn't planned for. So it really likes foreign languages. <laughs> And if you wanted a nice pattern, we found out that Leet Speak and emoticons worked really well, too. Because of the switch between capitals, letters, um, numbers, and punctuation. Um, so, and then there were some ideas that we threw around for later versions, like using Morse code. Um, you talked about phoneme mapping, Jonathan. Um, so those, those haven't gotten done yet, but I'm hoping to soon with a new architecture that I want to work on. Um, and here's another project that I built called Force Feedback Reality. Uh, I just wanted to build something for like under five bucks that I could take to the Dory Alley Fair with me this year just to kind of test out, see what it was like to test in, a, test in a live environment. And so I built a board that has one um, A to D converter, with analog to digital converter, which um, would take some sort of sensor and change that into a vibration value. And I had three sensors that went with this, just a simple switch sensor that went in your pocket, a, um, which was that up there. And then the cool one was the light sensor. So it ended up being the darker it was, the faster the vibrator went. Thus, the dark alley detector. Um, and it, the other cool thing about it was wherever you put the, um, the light sensor in your pocket, since it was an outdoors, you were getting uh, light. You were getting the sun as a light source. Light would bounce down, and where it would bounce in your pocket to reflect would actually change the light sensor. And so, as you're walking, the cloth on your pocket moves, which moves the light sensor, which therefore makes the vibrator pick up your gait structure as you're walking. All for two bucks. <laughs> I mean, so there was really cool emergent properties, and just putting new sorts of sensors and new sorts of interfaces on these things, and then you contextualize them with sex, and they just get all sorts of fucked up. Through. Cool. Uh, so, what is the future, or at least what do I think the future is? Uh, first off, biometrics. We have access to the information from our body in a myriad of ways now, and it's almost becoming affordable for us. These two things up here on top are EEGs, um, so uh, electroencephalograms. 
and that basically uh, check the uh, current on the surface of your brain. And you can tell things like excitement levels, uh, fa uh, what your face is doing, so whether you're blinking, whether you're smiling, whether you're frowning, so on and so forth. Um, and you can actually also tune them to brain macros. Uh, so you can think things and things will happen on screen. Uh, this, yeah, this one up here, the Open EEG is actually open source. And there's a whole bunch of um, new software for it, actually. And the other one up here, this is the Emotive Helmet. This is going to be marketed as a video game consumer device. So uh, I actually saw a demo of this earlier this year. They were using a Harry Potter game. And you could sit there and stare at the screen and think in a certain way, and he cast a fireball spell or something like that. But what we could do with this for sex, oh man. <laughs> uh, just getting the mapping and figuring out what's going on and then using these values to, um, uh, to map back to whatever software is controlling you or your computerized domination software or whatever else. Um, yeah? Well, we try not to have people upset and using their um, toys at the same time. Um, <laughs> uh, and this is the White Stone, which I actually just got one of. It measures um, heart rate variance and um, galvanic skin resistance. So basically, how fast your heart's moving and how much you're sweating. And you can get a lot of stuff from that. What it's used for is uh, a game called Journey to Wild Divine, which is a game that teaches you to relax. So it uses your biometrics to tell you, okay, you need to breathe more, you need to, and as you do these things, like nice, wavy, glittery things move around the screen and you somehow become more relaxed. But even so, selling for $130 now for nice, it's decent medical equipment. And finally, um, something that I'm kind of working on myself, but boy, this is even worse than shocking yourself in the nuts, shocking yourself in the brain. Um, this is what's known as galvanic vestibular stimulation. It's uh, been around for about 100 years, but it's really been getting popular lately. What you do is you put pads on your mastoid processes right behind your head because they figured out that a current of 2 milliamps or less going through here will actually cause your balance to fall off. Think about the BDSM involved in that. You lose the way you lose any way to be able to control which way you're leaning. They've actually also got it synchronizing with music, and it starts to play with your field of vision at about um, 120, 60 to 120 hertz. So your field of vision actually starts moving back and forth to try and adjust for what your brain thinks is a balance issue. There's a ton of things that can be done with this. Um, and here is actually a video of. Um, a, friend of, a friend of mine from Europe that's, uh, for those of you that saw the electric orifice, yeah. this is an, a, an air sen a pressure sensor that you can put in um, anywhere that your Kegel muscles can um, contract on, and it will tell how hard you are contracting. So with this, he's actually controlling the uh, volume level, depending on how hard it's squeezed. And um, yeah, during orgasm, the anal sphincter will involuntarily contract. So he's actually using this to control music based on his involuntary muscle reactions from his orgasm. Um, and there's actually like a full video of it, um, but I don't know if you people deserve that. <laughs> Um, actually, I'll just show you the setup he's doing right, real quick here. He's using electrostimulation on this side to um, cause himself to orgasm over, this is like a four or five minute video. Uh, but he causes himself to orgasm, but also has the pressure gauge down here to show exactly what his muscles are doing at all times. And that's also being recorded back in the computer. So think about what you could do with that in terms of teledildonic software and stuff. Instead of just having that slider bar, now you can actually have what is really happening inside you go to that other person. Um, I have this. <laughs> so um, in terms of software, I really, I feel like we're going to get the pluggable interface at some point. And I really just need to sit down and write the fucking thing. All we need is some sort of glue that says, okay, here's how I want to be able to interact with something. Now send it to that sex toy. 
and we need it to be open source, and we need it to be easy to access, easy to write for, and cross-platform. Because what you're going to want to what you're going to want to do is get a toy that hooks up to USB or something like that. The drivers are there and ready to go, and then you can go. Okay, I can go download this script that will control it with my music. I can download this script that will control it with Second Life. This one with a video game. This one with the new anal balloon pokey thingy that I just got. Um, it's it's really easy. This is not difficult engineering at all. We just need the basis and the middle part to be able to connect everything into. Um, and I highly recommend doing that with Python scripts because that's what I program everything in right now. And then just have a C++ in the middle, uh, C++ GUI in the middle. And any of you that are engineers that want to know about all specifics, just come talk to me afterward. Um, but really what this can uh, also do is implement a closed loop, uh, a closed feedback loop. So uh, it, from, from this program, you don't always have to be feeding it out to another person. You can feed it back into yourself. So as your pulse rate varies, you can feed that back in to your vibrator, which could then be feeding off into the virtual world or something else, and you actually become a fully meshed control system. Um, and where that can go, sky's the limit. I'm not even making any predictions there. So finally, and I will hurry through this because I think I'm almost out of time. Um, Okay, I've got two minutes to get through this part of my presentation. Um, <laughs> what is the result of interface research? Well, this is a new, uh, new piece of uh, hardware that I just did this week uh, that I will be presenting in terms of microtransactions, because I know how much everyone loves microtransactions and wants them to happen. So, mapping novel physical input methods to microtransactional interface systems to increase usability. Um, what are microtransactions? Microtransactions are pretty much anything under a um, like five dollars or something. If you just wanted to send someone a few cents, it's kind of like a tip jar. The problem with microtransactions microtrans is getting people to get to a point where they can easily send a microtransaction. They have to sign up to a special service and put their credit card in and everything else. So we've got to be able to make make that worth it. But we don't really have an interface to that because it's always a, a picture on a web or a button on a web page or something like that. I mean, really, our our real world interfaces are tip jars, and that's not all that interesting to a technical crowd. But really, what if we could do something in, with a physical interface to your computer that would allow you to advance past the tip jar? Well, it's a tip jar too. But it's a tip jar that's connected to something that has context that people are going to want to use. And therefore, I posit the idea that if we combine computers with underwear, you could make small transactions easy and fast, and people would want to do them. And so I give you the monitor string. This is actually on my laptop because I have a 22-inch widescreen, and that that take kind of big underwear, um, and, <laughs> like inhuman sized, um, and so you um, you can put the uh, underwear on your computer, easy, out of the way, simple to hit, and then you put it, there's a touch sensor that I built that you can put under it. So what it does is it. Um, you get a webcam, like your eyesight or whatever else, you show the denomination of money to it, it figures out, okay, that's how much money you are wanting to debit from your virtual account. And then you put it in. And here is a demo of the system working with a stripper in Second Life, actually. So I showed the money to the camera, you, put it, you pull up the G-string, put the money under it, and then once it hits the button, it debits that much from your account and gives it to the other person. So it is a transactional system for microtransactions. <laughs> I have no life. <laughs> so really, what are the pros and cons of a system like this? What, what are we getting out of it? I mean, obviously the pros. It's easy, it's fast, and it's cross-platform. So all this is a button. It's easy to program a button on Mac, on Linux, on Windows, on... Ah, uh, whatever else. Um, the cons? Really, what's wrong with it? It's it's perfect in every way. <laughs> and so, therefore, questions? I guess like one question, one oh, quick question. Thanks. Yes, I'm so sorry. Okay. 
The lack of one. Please come here. The title of your talk was Getting the Message Across. What's the message? Ah. The message. Ooh. <laughs> The message is whatever you want it to be. Ooh, isn't that meta? Um, but that is the idea. The fact that um, through the internet, and through these toys, and through the pluggable interface I want to do, um, the, you should be able to play with any toy you want, any way you want, unhindered by commercial, um, commercial viability of it, or whatever else. That's the wonderful thing about the virtual worlds, like Second Life. You can be anything, do anything, any way you want. And we need to make it, it's easy to, it's, well, it's somewhat easy to do that through uh, sight and through sound right now, but through haptics, we don't really have much of that yet. So the message should be whatever you want it to be, and it should get across quickly, easily, and free. Um, anyone else, before you want us notice? <laughs> Thank you. Oh, wait, wait. Okay, Kyle is one of our co-organizers of the uh, Irish Electronica Festival, so he's here around all day long, and possibly, I hope, tomorrow too. Oh, yeah, I'll be here. So there will be many, many possibilities to ask him questions, and, of course, together with Matt, uh, have like a demo of the bowling list or possibly like today or tomorrow. Okay.